Hello, my name is Professor Hayes from Kent State University, and today we're going to be discussing the contiguity principle. If you're wondering why I'm talking to you from my lovely Chevy Cruze, it's because my in-laws are very noisy, and this is the quietest place that I could find. But back to the subject at hand, which is that if you're like me, you were thrust into the world of online instruction uh, and you weren't quite prepared for it. I myself, I'd never taught online classes before, and suddenly my university decided to offer the class that I taught, communication theory, online. I had to develop online lectures for each of the lectures I gave in my face-to-face -face class. So my strategy was I'll take the face-to-face -face class PowerPoints and lectures and move those over to the online class. Well, unfortunately, uh, students in my online class weren't doing as good, weren't doing as well as the students in my face-to-face -face classes. And what my... Uh, my online students communicated to me was that the lectures were kind of hard to follow along with. What I didn't realize at the time is that my copy-paste design was sort of flawed from the start. If you teach online courses in higher education and you're planning on transferring material or using somebody else's material, don't make the same mistakes that I did and instead adhere to the contiguity principle. So today we're going to examine the two parts that make up the contiguity principle, the aptly named contiguity principle one and contiguity principle two, with a focus on how to apply these principles when designing or redesigning e-learning multimedia. If you have taken a basic psychology course, you might be familiar with the concept of working memory. If not, a good analogy is to look at the human brain as a computer with working memory acting as RAM or random access memory. If you have too many windows open or too many programs running, the computer will run slowly. Or if it's like mine, it'll just crash and you'll get the blue screen of death. Our minds and working memory can also become overloaded if we're trying to process too much at once and we're going to miss a lot and similarly crash to the blank stare of death. The question then becomes, how can we present students with content that doesn't risk overloading their working memory capacity? One answer is to ensure that the multimedia we create adheres to the two parts of the contiguity principle. Contiguity principle one states that printed words should be placed near corresponding graphics. Contiguity principle two affirms that spoken words should be synchronized with corresponding graphics. The following case presents a bad example of contiguity principle one. Notice how on the left hand slide the text is miles away from the graphic. Contrastingly, on the right hand side, we can see a good example where the text is incorporated into the graphic. Contiguity principle two can be demonstrated more easily. Imagine you were listening to this presentation without any visuals at all, and I promise to email you the slide presentation afterwards. Hardly any help at all, right? Explanations should accompany animations, videos, and slides to reduce the amount of information we need to hold in working memory. The next slide presents a bad example. At this time, pause the video and closely examine this slide. What would you change to have this example abide by contiguity principle one and two? See if your corrections match my suggestions. So looking at the correct answer slide, we can see that we've made a lot of changes. Most notably, right in adherence to contiguity principle number one, we've moved the text to match the graphics. And you can see the graphics make a lot more sense with the text lined up right next to them. We can see here the four periods of media history uh, are associated on a kind of timeline. So we know what comes past, present, and future, so to speak. The other changes we've made here, if you want to abide by contiguity principle number two, is just like I'm doing. Make sure you're not showing students this slide and then talking about this concept later. You want to show the slide, and as I'm doing uh, with you right now, explain what is happening and what's going on. So if you were able to predict this, that we would move the text and the pictures together, and that we would want to present this in a way that we were talking about the information that appeared on the slides at the same time, so everything was synchronized, then you recognize how to apply the contiguity principle, both principle one and principle two, to reduce working memory burdens, thereby making it easier for learners to comprehend your multimedia content. Keep in mind that digital spaces are fundamentally different from face-to-face -face spaces. When you're standing in front of a PowerPoint, it's easy to point at a screen and connect text to graphics or talk over a video to provide comments. Online, we have to adapt 
and remember to build these easily overlooked components into learning materials to make it easier for students to learn.